co-lead and executive director, IDO.org, Jocelyn Wyatt. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're nearing the end of CGI, so uh, we're looking forward to spending one of these last sessions with you. So welcome to Designing Ideas. How can we strive towards zero waste in global supply chains? I'm Jocelyn Wyatt. And I'm Gabe Kleinman. And we're going to start with a quick video. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, American industrial facilities generate 7.6 billion tons of industrial solid waste each year. Industrial waste is just one of several forms of corporate waste, all of which emit large amounts of greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. Globally, the waste sector accounts for 3 to 4 percent of annual greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing waste has positive impacts on the environment and human health and reduces costs for companies. Many companies are taking steps to decrease or eliminate their waste at every step of the supply chain. From the cultivation of food and the extraction of resources, to the manufacturing, packaging, and shipping of products. Reducing waste does more than make our ecosystem and us healthier. It can also increase a farmer's, supplier's, or multinational's bottom line. Farmers who are able to use agricultural waste for fuel or fertilizer save money and increase their incomes. Processors who are allowed to recycle byproducts into usable materials can sell more goods and increase their profitability. These efforts, combined with reductions in packaging and shipping materials, decrease the need for space in landfills. Innovations in recycling can make use of what was formerly thought of as trash and create jobs in the waste sector along the way. Companies around the world, and working to prevent, reduce, recycle, and repurpose waste, are collectively moving towards a zero waste system in which as little as possible gets sent to the landfill. With so many steps in the process of production, there are a multitude of answers to the question. How can we use the CGI community's knowledge to strive towards zero waste in the global supply chain? So today's session is going to be a bit different. For any of you who have been to the design labs that we've had over the past couple days, you'll know that in this hour and a half long session, you will actually be designing solutions. This is an opportunity for you to be inspired by new ideas related to waste management and redesign of supply chains. This is an opportunity to generate new ideas and a way to develop one idea further through prototyping. It's an opportunity to share and get to know the others at your table a bit more so that hopefully you can make some great connections uh, with other people who are also interested in this space and a way to discuss next steps. How are you going to take some of these new ideas forward? So typically what we would do at this point with uh, our work with IDEO or IDEO.org would be to go out to the field, to go and talk to people who are involved in supply chains and waste management. We would talk to waste pickers and we would talk to companies. And we would actually go to the places where this issue is affecting people in really significant ways. But unfortunately, we're in the Sheridan in New York and we only have an hour and a half. So we're going to take a modified approach to that, which is that we have two experts who are going to come and share some of the issues related to waste management in supply chains with us. So I'm going to call Dr. Jingwei Li and the professor at Qingwei University and Linda Fisher, the vice president and chief sustainability officer of DuPont to the stage. And as they're speaking, listen for for what they're saying in terms of what some of the needs are related to waste management and supply chain issues, hear what 
how these issues are affecting people, what new solutions or opportunities there might be, and listen for different types of business models, financing models, or ways in which we might work, make these solutions work for companies. We'll be using um, some of that content to actually brainstorm and prototype solutions after they finish their, their talks. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Lee and Linda Fisher to the stage. Thank you, Jocelyn, for introducing us. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm glad that I have this opportunity to share my experience in CGI. I'm also glad that so many participants here to pay attention to zero waste in global production, uh, global supply chain. This topic is very meaningful for all sustainable development. Why? If you have the number, you will say yes. Now the global waste generation is about 11 billion tons a year. How large it is? If you fill in the truck, trucks contain 300 circles around the equator of the globe. It means that almost every day we have one circle of waste trucks around the globe. Waste including many types and from many sources, from industry, from daily life, or our city infrastructure. It could be garbage, could be resources. Here I mainly highlight industrial waste, e-waste, food waste, and packaging waste. Why I focus on industrial waste? That's because industrial waste um, account for 84% of the total waste, especially many of them is hazardous. For industrial waste, the global focus was illegal dumping, uh, putting the waste in somewhere without considering the regulation, the transboundary movement between countries, and the improper uh, recycling, storage, and disposal. In 2006, because of the economy benefit, a company from Europe using a Panama ship offloaded more than 500 tons of toxic waste at the Ivory port of Abidjan. Then this waste spread across the city and surround the area, caused serious environment and home health problems. The second waste stream I would like to talk is e-waste. Why? Because in the last 10 years, e-waste has become the world's fastest growing waste stream. For example, in Europe, e-waste increased by 16 to 28% every five years, which is three times faster than municipal solid waste. Now the global e-waste generation is 40 million tons a year. E-waste including plastics, metals, glass, this can be resources, but also have additives. They are toxic substances, such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and prominent flame retardant. For e-waste, million tons of them flow to informal recycling uh, facility, and the residuals was dumping in the residential area. So this is the picture is related to a uh, informal sector for e-waste recycling. Let's move to another waste stream that directly related to all of us. This is food waste, a big problem waste. One point three billion tons of food is lost or become waste every year which is about one-third of the global food production. In many countries, food waste is extremely difficult to manage, such as producing cooking oil from restaurant used oil and from waste animal fats. 
flow to landfill sites, some of them is uncontrolled landfill, even open dumping. This cannot accept, but often happen. Packaging waste is another waste stream that need pay attention. We hope our products, our gifts, more beautiful. We use the bottom water, bottle water, plastic cup. We produce mulch, a packaging waste. The global packaging waste generation is uh, about 400 million tons a year. For packaging waste, the main problem we call wet pollution, because most of the plastics is wet. It's referred to two negative effects, video pollution and potential hazard due to the improper uh, management of plastic rubbish. So you can see this picture is uh, taken from a village. I highlight these four types of plastic, uh, of waste, but we do have thousands of types of waste need to be dealt with. Improper recycling and disposal, uncontrolled flow di direction, cause big pressure to the environment and home health. I would like to say today, we are facing with a great challenge for waste. The first is that waste occupy our living space, valuable land resources, and pollute our environment. They are important source for dust, pollute groundwater, surface water, and soil. Sometimes the waste pile even uh, collapses to destroy the villages. The second is that the enterprise do not take their responsibility, especially for those end-of-life products. They do not use environment-friendly uh, design, not recycle their end-of-life products, not use cleaner technology, not take the responsibility for proper treatment of their waste. The third is the consumer does not realize they are the big producer of waste. They are not fully used the left bank of the products, not well managed the spare, uh, expired time for their food, use more plastic bags, not separate recyclables from the garbage. In order to resolve the waste problem, I would like to invite all of you act to reduce, reuse, and recycle them for zero waste in global supply chain and for getting rid of waste from our land. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee, uh, for setting up this discussion uh, with the issues associated with waste. What I'd like to highlight for you today is some of the progress that's taking place and identify some of the challenges that have limited that. First of all, I agree with Dr. Lee we really have to get a hold of our waste issues. 11 billion tons a year, and I think that's probably conservative, of resources that are put into landfill are no longer available for use by society. Food that doesn't go into mouths to be eaten, energy that could be used um, to, to heat homes and to light homes, metals that could be used for new products. Landfills create a number of societal challenges. As Dr. Lee said, if they're unregulated, they create huge environmental problems. But even where they are regulated, they are a source of methane, which is one of the most potent uh, global, warming, global warming gases. So the need to address waste is real. We have to affect individual behavior and the behavior of businesses. And I think it first does need to start with a very strong regulatory program with strong enforcement. That not only helps protect the environment, but it helps create the economic incentives for business and individuals to think about waste differently. So the regulatory framework doesn't just have to be around disposal practices. It can also require take back. We've seen a lot of progress with take back uh, legislation in Europe. And it can also um, be mandatory recycling programs. And we have a number of those in the US. Again, they have changed behavior, I think, in a positive way. But if we're really going to challenge, uh, meet the challenges of eliminating waste, we really need to look at the US EPA hierarchy, source reduction and reuse, recycling, composting, energy recovery, 
and ultimately for what's left, treatment and disposal. So first, reduction. The most important element is to reduce the generation of waste. It not only eliminates the problem, but it allows you to use the resources more effectively. Packaging is probably a perfect example of where a lot of work has gone on in industry, both with manufacturers uh, as well as with retailers, um, to reduce the amount of packaging material. A lot of innovation has taken place in the materials, a lot of redesign of packages um, to improve uh, and reduce packaging in the U.S. and around the world. Coca-Cola is a great example. They have trimmed the weight of their 20-ounce plastic bottle by more than 25 percent. They've shaved about 30 percent of the weight off their 12-ounce aluminum can, and they've lightened their 8-ounce bottles by 50 percent. Bottom line, less packaging also means less transportation costs, less fuel costs, less uh, greenhouse gases. And better yet, in 2011 to 2012, they report a savings of approximately $180 million from their packaging initiatives. So real dollars. Food waste, as Dr. Lee said, is also a huge issue. But it's different in developing nations versus the developed nations. All you had to do is look at the lunch today to realize in the developed world, places like the US, Western Europe, food waste is really at the, at the end of the supply chain, largely with the consumer. But as we saw in the video, in developing nations, it, it really is in the field. How do you get the food off the field and to the consumer when it can still be consumed? The challenge, um, a, a program that was put together in Tanzania to address the challenge, I think, is one worth highlighting. It focused on providing female farmers solar drying uh, equipment that would allow them to get the residual um, fruits and vegetables from their farms, dry them, and allow them to move into the market while they could still be sold. And the project actually helped create that market. The next best approach to dealing with waste is reusing and recycling. Here Subaru gives us a great, uh, some great examples of what they have done. They report that they're recycling and reusing about 95 percent of their waste. Their copper-laden slag, which is left over from their welding operations, is collected and sent to Spain for recycling. Their styrofoam forms that they use to package really delicate engine parts are recollected, sent back to Japan so they, they can be used on, a net, on another shipment. Recycling also offers great opportunities to extend the life of materials. At DuPont, our building innovations business, the one that um, uh, manufactures and sells Corian, decided that they wanted to try to get to zero landfill. And so they had tried to identify a number of different uses for, for the residual waste um, of Corian that was coming out of our plants. The challenge to us was we really didn't understand and we didn't have the ability to think about how else to use waste Corian. So we partnered with about eight different organizations, including our customers, and identified some uses. And about a year and a half ago, we announced that our Corian business is now zero waste. But the challenge there was the creativity in thinking of what the uses could be. The next level of the EPA uh, hierarchy for waste is energy recovery. According to EPA, for every ton of waste processed at a waste to energy facility, approximately one ton of greenhouse gases can be avoided. Specifically, it's methane not generated. The materials or the metals that can be collected before the uh, before the energy process begins uh, can be recovered and recycled. And the energy that's created generally offsets uh, fossil fuels. So our ch and the challenge for energy um, recovery, waste to energy, is really, I think, one of mindset. The technology is there. It has been significantly improved. But many people still see it as a technology that has emissions that are harmful, even though, even though that issue has been addressed. So what's needed to drive the development of a comprehensive waste energy strategy, a strategy that challenges all of us to think differently about waste, how we can eliminate it, recycle it, um, and how we can reuse it. So those are the barriers that I hope everybody at their table will begin to address. Some of them that I have identified, um, we need creative people. We need to think about ways to tie the people who manufacture the waste with those that might be able to help them think about more creative uses for it. 
we need to think through markets because if the, if the recycled materials or the reusable materials um, are going to enter the commercial chain, they've got to have value and have got to find that market. We need to think about infrastructure. Dr. Lee talked about uh, e-waste, a big infrastructure challenge. And then there's issues around capital. How we, do we get companies and others to invest in uh, technologies that will reduce the generation of waste or encourage reduction in recycling? And then lastly, what are the right policy frameworks to incent the right behavior, not only with the manufacturing sector or with industry, but all the way down to the consumer? So with that, let me close and turn it back to our moderators. Thank you, Linda. So we just heard from, uh, from a couple experts, uh, but I imagine there are a few experts in the room. You all came here for a reason, either because you were interested in learning a little bit more or you were interested in actually sharing some of your own experiences. So let's take a minute so you can introduce yourselves uh, at each of your tables, um, who you are, what you do, where you work, uh, and then maybe a brief experience of something that's relevant to the challenge that we're facing today. So start sharing. Got about five minutes. Oh, 
So there's about one minute left, so if some people haven't been introduced, let them, let them introduce themselves. All right, 30 more seconds. Okay, I'm sorry to cut I'm sorry to cut off. We're down to a minute by minute schedule here. So we're going to we're going to we're going to plow right ahead. So now comes, now comes the fun part. Uh, now comes brainstorming. So gentlemen, loosen your ties. Ladies, do something that I don't know what to do without being inappropriate, so I won't say anything. Um, so I'm gonna go through the rules of brainstorming. And you would normally think that, oh, it's brainstorming. There are no rules. It's all about crazy ideas and going off the wall. Well, that's not the case, actually. At IDEO, we have some strict rules that we abide by in order to ensure that we get the best ideas and that we're as generative as possible. So here are the rules. Number one, defer judgment. We are in a generative mode. We are not in a critical mode. So uncross your, uncross your arms and be open. Uh, don't judge people's ideas. Uh, just try and come up with uh, more, more and more ideas. Uh, encourage wild ideas. So the wilder, the better. And it's not because those ideas specifically will be the solutions that we're looking for, but because aspects of those ideas might inspire other types of ideas as well. So encourage crazy, wild ideas. The third one, build on the ideas of others. So we're all in this together, right? Uh, so be generous and build on other people's ideas. It'll make them better. Go for quantity, I mentioned it before, more ideas. The more ideas, the better. The more ideas, the more that can be built upon and the more inspiration that you have. So you've got these sheets at your table, which I'll talk about in a minute, but you wanna, you wanna fill those things up. You wanna see lots and lots and lots of ideas, more to choose from. One conversation at a time. If you're having a side conversation, then you may be talking about something that everybody else would want to hear about. Uh, so make sure that everybody can hear what you're talking about and stick to one conversation at a time. Stay focused on the topic. It's really easy to drift. Don't be tempted to do so. Keep yourselves accountable to one another and stay focused on the topic. 
And then be visual. So if you're thinking through an idea or you're talking about it and you're not writing it down, then it's going to get lost. So anytime you have an idea, write it down on those blue post-its right there. You've got Sharpies and blue post-its uh, at your tables. Use them. So to recap, the brainstorm rules, defer judgment, encourage crazy stuff, build on the ideas of others, go for quantity, one conversation at a time, stay focused on the topic, and be visual. So one more thing, and I mentioned it before, use a Sharpie, use the Post-its. You, you have these sheets on your table. You should be filling these up with ideas. And given the weightiness of this topic, it's pretty easy to get into an academic conversation around different considerations, what we might want to do. Um, what I would say here is really try and, get, try and get specific and try and get tangible with kind of tactical solutions. It could be, for those of you in the US who know Best Buy, there's a geek squad that they have. So maybe it's the geek squad for, uh, uh, for, for waste in supply chain that can go to different companies and just do quick problem solving. Maybe it's uh, a knowledge sharing platform that enables different types of knowledge sharing. So get, get specific with the ideas. Try and, get, uh, try and get out of our heads. Okay. All right, so uh, we're going to make it a little bit easier for you and give you three structured questions for brainstorming. You're going to have seven minutes to come up with as many ideas for each of them as possible. So the first question is, how might we incentivize the overall reduction of waste? So consider how we might incentivize the reduction of food waste, of industrial waste, of e-waste, or any other kind of waste that you can think of. All right, so you have seven minutes. Get visual, use your Post-its and Sharpies, and go.
Capture that idea? Yeah. Can you write it down? Great. Want to fill this book? Cool. All right, two more minutes for this question. All right, put your final ideas down for this question, please. And, it, and it's okay, if you really love them, you can come back to them next time. All right, so before we go into the second question, can you all hold up your boards and show the rest of the room how many ideas you have so far? Hold them up proudly. Oh, these guys over here got so many that it's, it's like they're falling off the sheet. <laughs> I know. I think, yeah, you guys need to show, yeah, hold that board up. You guys are making progress back there. All right, show, show your team. <laughs> All right, good work, guys. All right, so great. Would Fair, love to see some more drawings. So stick figures, arrows, circles, website, simple diagrams. Website mock ups. Yeah. Use those markers um, and a little bit of creativity and even bad drawing skills will go a long way. So question number two, how might we encourage innovation in waste reduction? So consider corporate initiatives, financial and other initiatives, and scientific research. Seven minutes and go.
Two more minutes. the term queen tech for my sins. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I'm going to leave in a couple minutes. So okay, let me, can I just announce this question, then I'll come back yeah, yeah. and talk to you. One second. All right, and we're going to move on to the third question, which is, how might we share knowledge about effective waste management? So consider the development of new networks, technologies, and platforms. So again, you guys have seven minutes for this, and then you're going to have to choose one of these ideas. So final opportunity to come up with a lot of ideas to select from. Yeah, so just saying, Justin, that uh, I'd love Do to you work with Sagan and Mike? No, I'm, I'm not.
Two more minutes. All right. Time to wrap it up. Okay, everyone, I hate to interrupt the conversation, but we need to move on. So I'm just going to talk over you, and I hope you listen. Okay. So now it's time to vote. That means that it's time to actually select one of the ideas or to combine a few of them into kind of one idea. There are stars at your table. Um, each of you get three votes individually. You each get three votes. And you can place a star on an idea that you like. Or if you really like one, then you can put three stars on one idea. And then I guess alternatively, if you all just kind of agree or know which idea it is that you want to build out further, then you can just kind of agree on that one. Make sure that the, the voting process is kind of a communal dialogue as well. So you got three minutes. You ready? All right, go.
All right, you got about 30 seconds left to decide. Okay, everyone, if you haven't decided by now, then you might be in trouble. <laughs> you guys are done back there, right? Oh, you guys are done. All right, fantastic. Looks like a lot of stars across the board here. I don't know. That means a lot of good ideas. Okay. So, what's up next? Now that you've hopefully selected one idea or brought a few ideas together, now it's time to refine and actually visualize this idea. So this is prototyping. We're going to get a little bit dirty here. Now, there are a couple ways to do it. Uh, the first one is that within, the, within your little plastic containers on the tables, um, there's a concept journey map where you actually can talk about kind of what the concept is and then how it plays out, kind of defining key moments or experiences for the people who you're designing for. Um, and then an actual visualization on the bottom, drawing actual pictures. You've got construction paper and scissors and markers on your table. Use them. Um, so if you decide not to use this, or if you want to use it, you can just do something completely on your own. And I will... There you go. So we have a couple examples um, just to inspire you. So certainly we've seen many of these filled out with great sketches um, of these journeys and the concept visualization. But you can also take it like this one where um, this, is, this is from the Women in Mobile session where people actually drew the different screens that would be on the mobile phone and then affixed them to the sheet. Um, an even more creative idea, this was in Cherie Blair's group, by the way, so anyone can be a designer. Um, so this is a mobile phone which has a variety of apps which are specially designed for women. So you guys can get really creative with the things that are on your table and in your backpacks um, if you so choose. So you have 12 minutes for this part, so go for it and uh, refine and visualize your idea. Cool. So the, the only other thing I would say is when you're doing this, keep in mind who you're actually designing this for, um, kind of what's the, who's the customer behind this, um, how's this going to be financed and maintained, um, and then how's this going to be actually delivered to uh, whoever you're delivering it to. So we got 12 minutes, so get, get, get your hands dirty. So... 
forgot to do that yesterday. Yeah. I forgot to do this I yesterday. That. Yeah, I know. I totally just stepped to the camera. Like, oh, <laughs> I, forgot to, I forgot to do it yesterday. I was like, I forgot to do it.
Five more minutes. Three minutes. are better than my stick figures. I, I work at a company with brilliant people who are also brilliantly creative. And my drawings, I, I feel horrible. That is perfectly fine. It does the job. So I don't know how to draw. Uh, One more minute.
out for closing. All right, are you ready? So now the exciting part, um, we get to have you guys share with other tables. So who wants to go first? We're gonna ask you to share in two minutes or less just so we can make it around to everyone. All right, so there should be someone with a mic. I got it. Uh, there we go. Oh, right, we sent out um, all of our facilitators to the group, so <laughs> we can do it. Hello. Yeah, stand up. I, I'm going to introduce our group first. I mean, you obviously know Jinhin Lee, professor of exactly what we're talking about. Um, we've got Verena, we've got Salif, and we've got Turab, and you've got me, Philippe. In our little role play, Verena is going to be a consumer. Um, <laughs> professor Jinhin is going to be an intermediary, a waste management company. Salif is going to be Starbucks, <laughs> uh, or, you know, PNG or whoever feels that they, um, or Pepsi or you know, whoever um, produces things. And Shurup is going to be a waste picker who is going to be working on one of the big dumps in India or Pakistan or Mexico or other places. So uh, let's just assume that Verena goes to Starbucks and she buys a coffee. Now you have to, no, you're buying this coffee. You have to assume that, that Verena is basically buying the coffee in a package. Why is she buying it in a package? Because otherwise the coffee would just disappear in her hands. Now, there wouldn't be a problem if Verena takes, you know, drinks the coffee, there's no coffee left, she puts the paper away in a bin, and that paper has a high chance in America of being recycled. Um, however, right now, Verena has a, a lid that is made out of gold. Do you think that lid is going to go into any you know, waste bin? if it's made out of gold? No. Probably not, exactly. So one of the solutions we have, which is a pretty wacky solution, which therefore probably won't work, is to use very, very expensive packaging materials that you can turn into jewelry or that you can actually sell in the open market. But that's not gonna work, right? So let's go back to the drawing board. So Verena is not going to buy a normal cup of coffee, which has the same paper, probably some coffee inside that no one really wants to drink, but um, she's just drunk it. And she has a lid that's probably made out of LDPE, which is a plastic that is not worth a lot, and therefore, you know, usually gets burned on dumps, and if it doesn't get burned, it usually ends up in the ocean, okay? So that, right now, if she's in Mexico or if she's in Indonesia, that paper would get picked up at source, at the household, by someone called a pepenador or a picker, and he would then have a whole structure of people that would take that, and yeah, and Surab would basically make money and feed his family with as much paper that he can find. Very easy, he's not a very rich fellow, he makes do. In most cases, he has a mafioso structure above him, which basically says, give me about 80% of what you've just picked, I will pay you, and if you don't, by the way, I will come with my friends and you will get hurt. So it's a horrible system in most of those countries. Now what happens... Right, we're going to ask you to just wrap it up just well, so that, we can yeah, get that, the other groups. So what happens if you have extended producer responsibility where Starbucks is actually not just responsible for the coffee they put in but also for the package? So Verena basically buys the same coffee. Now Salif is going to go to Professor Jinhin, Jin Hint, sorry, and he is going to intermediate and say, I'm going to take care of your packaging. All right? And by the way, Salif is going to pay him to take care of that packaging so that none of this PP or LDPE ends up in the gutter. So he gets... Yeah, he pays you, and now you will pay. You will now pay Surab to basically pick up both pieces. Yeah. He will get paid to pick up both pieces. You have to pay me first. Yeah. He will now get both of those. And he will now make sure that this paper gets recycled, but also this PP 
gets recycled because he now has the money not only to pick it up, but to give it back to a recycling company who can actually do something with it. So it's extended producer responsibility. And Verena will be very happy. And, and, and you'll make a lot more money. And you will get a formal, you will get a uniform from him because he's now being paid by a responsible company who doesn't want to pay informal workers but wants to give social security to them and make them make their workplace better great all right thank you thank you all right who wants to share next all right in the back okay we had a larger team everyone just had to leave so so uh, we're called uh, Judge Waste. Um, so we were talking a lot about the fact that um, you know there's a there's a lack of there's a lack of trending why wasting is a bad idea. Um, and uh, and so what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a system where you actually have like an auditor or someone that comes and uh, judges the kind of waste that you're producing. So um, essentially, if you're a company, they're coming to not just judge to see the amount of waste, but they're actually measuring it, weighing it, uh, similar to your home. And what happens is if you go through that weighing scale and you're under a certain baseline of reduction uh, of waste, uh, you get incentives um, and you get promoted in a very positive way. Um, if you uh, have a lot of waste, you're essentially getting reprimanded. So you either have to get penalized, you pay some sort of um, um, additional um, uh, amount of money. Um, you also are now put onto the blacklist. So essentially, um, companies might not work with you because you're actually not uh, meeting certain norms that they actually abide by. And so um, the, the next step of that is really then sharing it on the right kind of social platform. So we're talking about making it trendy to reduce uh, waste reduction. And uh, you know it gets to that next point of if, if we collaborate this long enough, what happens is you can actually then start sharing your waste. So an idea that came up was saying that if you're using, if you buy a tent and you're not necessarily using it for an entire year, you can actually share that with your neighbor so you're not actually having to buy another tent um, as, as a concept. So on a financial plan, what we talked about was was um, if we become the raider of waste reduction that becomes essentially our financial tool, so we become kind of the raiders for waste and you s essentially start hiring us to measure and judge your waste because you want to be on that positive list and not be blacklisted. So it becomes kind of like a standard. Great. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Who else wants to go? Yeah, uh, there's a mic back there. Sorry about the technical difficulty. Okay, um, we were a little bit inspired by lunches at this. Clinton Global Initiative, where all of us sat at tables that were very empty and there was a lot of food. So that was one that we, we took on because we identified uh, uh, food waste and being able to turn that into energy as, as our topic. Um, but we decided to back way up, so we first talked about education. Uh, we thought there needed to be a lot of education, particularly in school, around food waste. Um, we then... Um, so we could get early adapters and just have kids start to think a lot more about um, what they're eating, the sizes, and what happens to the waste at home. Um, then we realized that part of it is we needed to uh, encourage people to do more about planning and quantity control. And we felt like with all the apps in America, in the world today, somehow organizations like the Sheraton ought to be able to figure out how many people have signed up and how many people are really going to show up for lunch. And if you had a technology like that, you could do a lot better planning. Um, um, then we talked about uh, portion size. Uh, you probably can't see that picture very well. Um, but in addition to too many plates of food, um, so often there's just more food than anybody really wants. And we've all sat down at lunches and thought, why am I having this? And uh, so shrinking the sizes uh, to something that's a bit more manageable might, would lead to better waste. Better waste. Um, then we um, talked about uh, what happens 
um, the concept of reuse in food doesn't sound quite right. But after the original user is done with it or not, how do we improve the ability to collect that and either take it to food banks or to homeless shelters where it might be used and then recollect that waste ag again um, and get it to some kind of energy uh, uh, anaerobic digester facility where you can create the energy from the food waste. So a number of steps starting from consumer education, planning, um, collection, sizing, and then ultimately, uh, rather than disposing of it, turning it into energy. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And do you guys want to share with your groups? Yeah? Great. Hi. Um, I'm Nate Morris, and um, we discussed a lot of some of the topics that you all have mentioned uh, over the last few presentations, but we really believe that most of the waste challenges that we face today are driven by uh, the lack of, of market-driven solutions uh, in this particular area. Uh, we recognize that first and foremost, we have to change the perception of what waste really is. Waste really represents all the inefficiencies that are coming out of a supply chain and really what's going wrong upstream but also that allows us to position that as a market correction once education happens and once procurement officers around the country or around the world, rather, uh, can begin to change their behavior into more of a market-driven approach. Uh, as you all know, uh, really two companies have dominated this space globally, Waste Management Republic Services, and they've really hoarded a lot of the information from the public and from uh, the global community at large. And so what we want to do is democratize that through a platform of in empowering individual vendors, small businesses around the world uh, to take part in this platform to essentially share their best practices, what they're doing in their local communities, and bringing them to the table to compete against uh, this large duopoly that exists globally. Uh, in the process, we're going to get to a true market value price uh, the other side of that is requiring these vendors to essentially hand over a lot of their metrics and data so we then can make market corrections uh, related to the company or the individual's waste and recycling profile. So it becomes uh, more obvious on how to recycle and how to get more to landfill diversion. So this is a, uh, a, an attempt at drawing a screenshot of what this profile looks like uh, from a dashboard perspective, and then also engaging through a mobile app as well uh, for our global platform. So, Great. Thank you. All right. And last. Come on. Who's going to do it? <laughs> So here we, oh, this is cute. All right. As a consumer, I'm going in to buy this product, right? And in addition to reading about the nutritional aspects on the product, there is another barcode that talks about the environmental impacts of it. There's a rating on each product that will allow me to know how it's been judged by the industry and um, a barcode. So being a consumer that trusts these things, I buy this, I consume it. And now I'm ready to get rid of it, but I'm a little confused about what I can recycle and what I can't. So I simply take my cell phone. I take my cell phone that has a great app on it and put it right here next to my barcode. Beep. And it allows me to know where I put this and where I put this. So if I recycle this, trash, whatnot. So it's an easy way for the consumers to know how best to recycle, and it also holds companies responsible because they want the best rating and they want their product to be recycled fully. And let me talk to the team about anything I forgot. <laughs> oh, okay, I that was it. <laughs> that was great. There were... Uh... There was a there's this great diversity and spectrum of thinking throughout the room from the industry level in trying to share knowledge and best practices from a an education standpoint, but also educating consumers and people, um, all the way up to the consumer level and kind of action oriented approaches, empowering consumers with uh, the ability to not just take action based on what they see companies doing, but also then holding those companies uh, accountable as a result because of that transparency. So, I don't know, it's a, nice, it's a pretty nice broad spectrum that, that you guys covered. Great. 
So in terms of uh, next steps, um, we are going to wrap up now. Uh, there's the closing plenary, so we'll ask you all to move into the ballroom. Um, before you do, make sure that you exchange contact information with people at your table or in other groups um, whose ideas you loved. If there's something that you want to follow up on related to this topic, make sure that you write your name and contact information on the back of the journey worksheets, and CGI can follow up with you. Um, and if you have any questions for, for us or our experts or uh, the CGI team, please stick around. So thank you so much for joining us today.